more so what I'm I'm keen well, on. Well, newsflash, man, like we're gonna have to contract government spending as it is, but we no, have, but let me, we let have me rolled out a lot of taxes. Let and me also, finish. I didn't get to say my answer. Okay, what yeah, I think yeah. is better. All right. So, <laughs> no, no. the the you go for it. My my thought is, and that's a good one for temporary help. It's amazing, but as like a long term fix. They need to look at the actual industry as a whole and try and reduce some of the tax and the measures that they put against it to make it easier to produce and actually have the product in our own country. When, 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 when I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Welcome back. Master Keys Podcast, Season 2, Episode... 27. You got that down, Pat. Happy... I'm Neil Andrino. And... What well, the, where you at? July 4th. Hi, I'm Chandler Halliburton. Yeah. Master Keys Podcast. This guy's all over the Podcast place. Podcast all about real estate, the market, life, love. Chandler doesn't lots. care, but for somebody listening who might not have heard it for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great. You should listen to the whole thing. It's amazing. It, it, it's a, we're a podcast talking about real estate investing, what's going on in the market. We're also realtors. We talk about that stuff as well. For you that are tuning back in, thanks for listening. What we're going to say, Chandler, it's the end of the month, the start of a new month. It's thanks summertime. Thanks for all the likes. Smash the like button right now in this moment. Right no there you no, go you no, did not gonna um it. is it called the fourth of july is called independence, independence day. day independence day happy independence day to our listeners south of the border both of you i will be south of the border <clears throat> oh yeah yeah when this airs when this airs i will be south of the border nice doing fourth of july nice. where it should stars be done and stripes we're at stars and stripes i'll be in idaho again with the idaho he always at the idaho Neil loves himself some potatoes. We're going potato picking. But, uh, yeah, no, it'll be good. So, Lots to cover in this episode. Yeah, let's get on what's going on today the episode. We have a bunch of interesting news, more chat about the market because everyone wants to know where the market's going, and we're yeah. trying to make our best educated, uneducated guess. Um, and then we also talk about, is the Burr model dead? The Burr model's dead. I'm is, calling it right now. A- anyone who listened to this might know about the Burr model. You Jesus. see it out there all the time. It's done. And the Taylor OPM, OPM is done. Absolute other people's money. statements, massive. Um, OTP model, other people's money, like you said. He also thinks that's dead. OPM, yeah. Is real estate just dead altogether? Uh, no, but those models... Are your models, clients going to call you after this? Uh, no, those <laughs> models just aren't sustainable in this current market. Mark, we're going to talk about why that is. Um, and something you don't deals? know about the Burr and OPM models, we'll unpack with that. Uh, what those are also. Um, I was going to make a couple corrections here of, of things. I mean... I still come back to this point about how wrong Neil was about Ch- those Taylor's rates. is going to keep revisiting it months later as the rates continue to increase. He's We're like, gonna have a new you segment can't get 4% anymore. Really. It's because they've gone Neil. up 100 basis points, Chandler. We're gonna a segment called Fact Checking Neil. Okay. Um, we should. Because I, I got some feedback on the $1.3 million, $1.3 million vacant homes in Canada. And Same. I was curious about that too. And it is not the case. No. <laughs> but it is as per, uh, per yeah. the resource that we had and we cited. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, it... it um, the, the long and short of that, you may have seen that clip, 1.3 million reported vacant homes in Canada. Um, it was better dwelling or something yeah, like that, better it, homes it, Canada. It, it was captured at a snapshot. Uh, and if if no one identified a property as their permanent residence on their census, it wasn't re- recorded. For example, recorded. A, student, a student. A student. A student would be renting a house at the university they live in, but when they fill it out, they put their parents' address. So now that house is considered empty that they're living in. Exactly. Same um, cottages and the all other. Stuff. The other interesting stat was if you sold your house and moved into your next house, by some chance, if the census was missed mm-hmm. during the interim between the new buyers moving in yeah. and the sellers moving out, that house also got labeled as vacant. Um what was the other one? And then there's there's actual um, like yeah, new secondary, secondary, secondary properties, properties, all that stuff. New construction. Yeah. So realistically, it's probably 20% of that number, Yeah. Um, which would make sense because driving around, you don't see the empty houses. I think there is still probably a fairly large number of empty homes in BC and Ontario because I think there's a lot of speculative investment. Is it enough to completely sway the market? No, but it's not a benefit. It's not also, a benefit to the also market. the point kind of stands because um, when you look at housing availability, there, there's a lot of people who don't like that people have second properties. They also don't like that properties get converted to short-term rentals and all these things that take away permanent residents. Got my first two coming on market. Yeah, yeah, you got your first Airbnb coming on market. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, the interest rates. So 
Uh, probably some people were super excited to go out there in the world and find Neil's 3.9 fixed rates and uh, didn't find them. <laughs> I know you're still going to defend this till the day I'm you die. I'm going to defend this till the day I die. And you're going to keep bringing it up as rates continue <laughs> to rise. The rates are rising. Yeah, yeah. So that, um, But one thing that was really interesting when I went into this and I, I talked to uh, my good buddy Igor, who's obviously a top mortgage uh, broker here in town, um, like one of the challenges, and this is also where people say, he well, cited his pe- source. people were dumb in saying that uh, locking into variable rates. It's like, well, the stress test, we were talking about this before we got on air. Everyone knows about the stress test where when you're applying for a mortgage, they don't approve you based on the rate that you're getting. Mm -hmm. They approve you at a slightly inflated rate. And why do they do that? Well, they do it because of what's going on right now. Fairly inflated, 200 basis points. Right. Um, Well, they they, they approve you based on either either 5.25% or your rate plus 200 points, your rate plus two. Whichever one is higher, that's what they stress test you at. So- Little example, when you've got these variable rates floating around out there, at, at one point in time, they were really low. 1.5%. 1.5%. They were stress testing people at 1.5% plus two or whatever the 5.25 was at the time. So it, it is, you were discouraged from going into fixed base products because their stress test was, was higher. So even now, sure, maybe you find one of Neil's magical fixed rates that are so good. I have, I, have a deal, I have a deal that just closed. Eyes. No, I have a deal that just closed like like three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, so when, when we when we first talked about it, and it was a brand new mortgage, it was not a refinance. Uh-huh. A bunch of people are like, oh, it's a refinance, it's a renovation. Insured or uninsured? It was uninsured. It was a commercial loan on a over a million dollar place. Like commercial loan? The whole shebang. And it was it was like the 3.94 that we brought up. And that was a purchase loan. It wasn't because we got a bunch of people who are mortgage un- professionals un- that have messaged us being like, oh, it's insured. It's a refinance loan. All this shit. No, it was none of those things. And this person didn't have a bunch of real estate to begin with. I don't know. So, I don't know. I don't know. I don't if, know. We, if we keep talking okay. about it every <laughs> time, it the rates are going to go up every single week. That's what's going on. So if you, yeah. if you try and get that number now, you're not going to be able to. And I've got one closing, you know, that's like 4.45 personally. Right. So I, I, I do know. Chaley's out here with a 7% rate written on his page, but he's taking 4.45. <laughs> 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 but I say, um, for what it's worth, though, one of the challenges right now for people going out there and saying, well, maybe I want to go fixed. Maybe I, I feel like being conservative and I want to take even say say it's a great fixed rate at 4.95 for yep. five years. Maybe they're saying that's what I want to do. Yep. They're being stress test at 7.25 percent, which is good. It makes it hard to get money, but it's makes good. it hard to get money. But or they can say, oh, or I can get this variable and the variable would be stress test at 5.25. They may not qualify mm. for the five-year fixed mortgage. A lot of people wouldn't so see that Or a very is small, why, way smaller amount. So all these people who comment like, oh, well, dumb people like taking these variable rates didn't know it was going to go up. You don't understand. It was out of necessity a lot yeah. of times, especially yep. as the market continued to run and run and run. The only way people could qualify for these was by getting the lower stress testing that a variable rate offers. So they're actively encouraging people, actively encouraging people to take variable money, and which again goes back to the conspiracy theory. Do, 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 do. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, is realistically, again, because the comment's going to be, well, they should have known better, blah, blah, blah. I think when you're in the heat of a moment and you have 10 days or five days, back when these rates were out, you had five days to get all this shit put together. You were just waiting here that you get approved. And you, you didn't ask questions on like, oh, like I have to take this variable to be approved. They were just like, you're approved. Here it is. The rate's one and a quarter and sign this thing and you're good to go. And everyone's like, hells yeah, one and a quarter money. I got approved. Yeah. I'm in it. You can't expect everyone to be a financial expert that understands all of it. And also in that super stressful time, they're also inspecting the house, getting a bunch also, of other man, shit how organized. Many, how many times have you worked with a buyer who said, oh, I'm shopping around with different mortgage professionals for the best rate. So the mortgage professional is not going to say, well, maybe you should opt into this fixed product. They're also so busy. Right? They they're going to get undercut yeah. by someone else saying, oh, you should go variable, blah, blah, blah. And come back into the, for the hundredth time, Bank of Canada said those rates are going to stay low until December 23rd of next year. So yeah. This way we're not going. But anyway, just unpacking some of those. Um, yeah, they're keeping your division Neil? today. Uh, let's get yeah, let's get into a little bit of news. <laughs> Segment one done. Segment one. Fact Attack checking. Neil. Check fire. <laughs> Errors and omissions. Uh, <laughs> um, so what do I have going You're on? Airbnb. Yeah, I was going to say, so like, again, uh, just to reiterate it again for anyone who's just checking in or anyone else that's wondering, I am pumping the brakes on purchasing for so many different reasons. And we're going to talk about it later on trying to understand the end values. That's like my biggest fear. I'm like, well, it seems pretty good today. But if I can't project this end value, how the hell can I know to buy this? Um, 
exit exit strategy. But what I am doing, and this is in an interest to try and increase cash flow because obviously bank rates are higher and the overall cost of operations higher. Uh, so I have some smaller two bedroom units that we're renting for 14, 1500 fully renovated. Um, and instead what we're going to do is we're going to run them on Airbnb. And so it, we've, I've never done it before. So we've gone through the whole process. Uh, my girlfriend's running it as the manager. And so she's putting yep. in a ton of work. Um, and we're at that point now where we've done the million Ikea trips, gotten all the little trinkets and all the crap that yeah, goes yeah. into it. You, I, I called you one time and you were at Ikea. Yeah. Yeah. Which I haven't been in years. an Allen key. Do you have an Allen key? I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally got blisters on my fingers from using the little miniature Ikea Allen keys, putting oh. together bunk beds. Man. Bunk beds? Oh, that was... I've oh, never gotten so beds. mad. So we thought we'd change it up. So we have one of them is going to have just two regular beds. Mm-hmm. But the other one we're going to do like a bigger, like a king size bed and bunk beds. And we're like, you know what? Can People, you can you put in the advertisement that the bunk beds are there so you have more room for activities? <laughs> yeah, you know, I literally said that, that, that as we were assembling. So them. much more room for activities. <laughs> um, and that was the that was the idea though. Was like people traveled family, so I figured I'd give them an option mm-hmm. to to get yeah. in. And to be honest with you, I think back to myself three years ago. If I was traveling with the boys and there was bunk beds, we would actually three years ago last three trip. Ago. I, yeah, this, this, Idaho. <laughs> yeah, Idaho. This this friggin' spring, I went to, I went out west and like we all used bunk beds because it was a way cheaper option than. Renting oh room my by room God. by room. One time when uh, we were traveling through uh, Europe, mm-hmm. uh, this was in Berlin, I think. And me and a couple boys <laughs> stayed in the hostel. And it was like there was space in this hostel, hostel for, I think, six people. Five of them were us. <laughs> and one of them was some other poor guy that was stuck in this hostel <laughs> with us. And at, at different points in times, we were in various states of intoxication and undress. <laughs> and this poor guy had a bottom bunk and I just remember we we're crawling in beds like three o'clock, you know, we were out at some, Berlin is a crazy town, by the way. That's like, anyway, we're not going to yeah. get into this. Um, <laughs> but I just look over and there's my buddy just naked going up the ladder, down, going up the ladder <laughs> while this other guy's lying there staring <laughs> up at him like, Jesus, <laughs> these damn Canadians. I've, um, I've had a few of those. Um, yeah, so bunk beds. Anyway, so Lots we're going to do fun. bunk beds. I don't want to know what goes on in the unit. Um, but, uh, we're supposed to be going live tomorrow. They're literally cleaning it right now. Photos this evening. I think Airbnb could take up to 24 hours to approve it. So we're hoping to be online. We're really hoping we get our first booking for this long weekend, uh, right. which is going to be oh, typed, yeah. but you get a lot of last minute bookings. So, so what, what's like the setting up an account like? Cause I'm kind of, yeah, so we we're, were trying to take one over from the existing owner. And like, so we had to create a new listing cause we couldn't just transfer over his account. Because, much easier to get a new account from what I've gathered yeah, because oh, they tie it to like literally your freaking DNA like they and yeah. which is good that they do that because that's what prevents people from acting shitty on Airbnb is they can cut your accounts and ban you for life yeah and you can't like buy someone else's property and then you get credit for being a super host even though you're terrible but the previous person was awesome that's a big thing that they exactly people would make super host accounts and sell them and stuff so it, it's actually really smart that they did it that way but again so we had those units they were only getting maybe 1500 bucks because they're small units we did a Airbnb has a little calculator that they use to project what they think you would earn. So we mm-hmm. put in all the stuff, our location, the amenities that we would have. And it spit out a dollar value, which was, I think, frig, I want to say like f- almost six, maybe six, 4,600 bucks. Mm-hmm. So we're getting 1,500. Yeah. So it's about triple. Now you got to keep in mind, there's a lot of expenses that go with that. Yeah. Um, but we're still hoping to boil out maybe three grand out of that $4,600. Um, so it'd be double what we were making before. And we just now we have to take into account that we spend a bunch on furniture. So to do the two of them, we spend about ten grand on furniture, uh, and then all the time and effort that went into it. We and just so those people wondering, he didn't videotape any of this, so we have no footage. I'm of an this. idiot. I know. I know. It, it happened quick, and the next one we do, I'll make sure I videotape the whole way through. But it would have been sweet because it was our first one, and we learned so many things in that short span of time. Um, but we're now, like I said, we're now set up. Uh, the account basically just needs all your information, the info on the listing. It's not too bad actually physically making an account. Mm-hmm. It takes about 24 hours to get approved. So hopefully within a day we're approved and then we're up. And I'll let you guys know how it goes like with bookings. and Because this is kind of a suburbia place. Like This isn't like a cottage rental. This is in a 12-unit building. It's not walking distance to anything, anything really specific. Yeah. Like it's, it's just kind of in a neighborhood. But again, when I filtered through Airbnb in our neighborhood for uh, entire apartment rentals, there was not a single one available until October. Yeah, not a single yeah. one. But on well, Airbnb, saying, you can see all the listings, and there was like eighty listings, but they were all booked. You might October. also get some inquiries for people being like, "Hey, Long can time. I come for three weeks, four weeks? You know, work." 
Um, That's what we're hoping. Yeah, my one down on the South Shore, which has three units in one building and then the yurt, uh, which people might have seen online. The three units in, in the building, they're running at about, like, oh, say 30 days in a month, um, 24 to 27 days for, for wow. June and July. Um, August <laughs> still filling up. So that's pretty good. That's really good. Uh, and they're about 110 bucks a night, give or take, plus or minus each one. And those units are probably rent for 1000 bucks a month if they were... Yeah, yeah, that's what they rent for in, in the off season. So you're getting so, about twenty five to 3000 a month out of those. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, you know, it's 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 good. Um, it's a lot. I mean, I'm dealing with someone down there who's like, "Oh, we need more of this. We need more sheets, more linens." You know, the coffee press and the yurt just stopped working. Like, so there's stuff, man. Um, it's it's an active business, and I'm yeah. already realizing that now as we're getting started. Um, I'm going to be paying my girlfriend a fee to manage it, just like you would with any other company. It's around twenty to thirty percent is what they usually charge, mm-hmm. um, plus consumables. And so we're figuring that out now. Like we're setting up a storage room on site that we're going to fill with all the consumables. And then the bigger one that I found tough was cleaning. Like you have a good setup because the previous owner that sold to you had basically a family member that handles the cleaning. And so you're able to pay them and keep that system rolling. Yeah. But finding a cleaning company that can clean something like that on a regular basis on a short term notice uh, for under like 80 bucks is really hard. Like every company I quoted was like 150, $200. And I'm like, how I can't charge a cleaning fee of two hundred dollars. Someone stays yeah. for two nights and they're only paying three hundred dollars for the rental. Yeah. So we had to find. We got. We got lucky. And we found someone. If there's anyone else out there that has good options, let me know. I'll be happy to hear it. Like we'd be good to so have. So the a couple management. Options. These management companies don't also take care of the cleaning. Also, and this is what happened: is a lot of the management companies started cleaning companies, and so mm-hmm. they'll say our manager for the Airbnb is twenty five percent, and then we have our partner cleaning company that we own, and they clean the units, and we charge a cleaning fee of ninety nine dollars, right. and they take the whole ninety nine dollars. Right. So it's, uh, and that's where those management companies make money. I have a few friends who started Airbnb management companies and every time within like two months, like, oh, I started a cleaning company and I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. But it's so that they can make clean the things because trying to get reliable, a reliable source that's a third party is impossible. Like you couldn't call Molly made to come Yeah, you have to have your own person who's on salary and be like, here's where you are today. Exactly. Go. That's the only way you can do it. Um, so anyways, hmm. again, if somebody has an option out there, let me know. We have found someone, uh, took a few calls here and there and this lady seems great. She did uh, hotels before. And that's like the lady that, that's managing my one down. So sure, she did motel before. Exactly. Yeah. So she's now doing this for four or five people, and she's going to add ours on there. So hopefully it works out well. Um, but it can be tough. If, if she's got four turnovers in one day, I don't understand. I don't know how it's even going to be possible. Yeah, that's why they keep a pretty big gap there. It's like, yeah, check out by 11, and you can't check until 3 because yeah. they're running around. like I'll be out there cleaning them. Yeah, um, I'd love to see that. That's so a video. I'd, I'd <laughs> that's a video that we could all get on board for. Um, <laughs> outside of that, same old thing. Like just trying to get things done. Um, the feeling frustration was just again where the rates came up a lot faster than expected. I had projects targeted to be completed by now. Mm-hmm. It's really going to impact the overall end values, cash flows, and those things. So it's trying it's to work like with that. Almost like your burn model hasn't quite worked out as well as you thought. So Chandler's trying to jump to the end of the the episode. So we're going to talk about that later. Um, we actually have boxing gloves this round for, <laughs> for this pod. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that's it really. The Airbnbs that were going up, um, we, we dropped a hint of it last episode, but same thing. We're trying to establish a real estate team to handle, uh, yeah. not trying. We have a real estate team running now and we are using that to handle a lot of transaction volume and everyone's getting really well trained up and in, in place. So everyone's, we have a really strong professional team that we're working with. So there's a lot of time and effort going in there. And then this podcast, like it's going to be. Uh, another big one. So those are kind of where my my time and energy is at, and I kind of am watching the market more sidelining, unless yeah. an amazing deal pops in my lap that's just too good to turn away. Yeah, we're super excited about the team, and and some folks were asking like, oh, did you start a brokerage? Like, no, we're we're gonna still operate under the Remax Nova banner, mm-hmm. which we're super excited about. Been there for a long time, um, but it's us combining forces with uh, some other great agents, um, and we're gonna do a future episode where we talk a little bit about the role of realtors in this changing environment. It's becoming um, a lot more important before anyone could sell anything and pretty much anyone could represent a buyer because you couldn't do conditions really. And it's just, a, it was trying to figure out who could bid the highest. But it's all, yeah, it's also now, well, if, if the buyer and the seller have access to this information, then what is your role, right? It's a, it's mm-hmm. a different role. And I was talking to um, our colleagues in, at the office, we have these sessions, uh, kind of a Q and a, and I was saying like, you have to know a little bit about what's going on in the world right now. And I'm not saying try to be an economic you know, expert order. Or, or, or be a forecaster because 
you know, we, no one knows. Even the even the greatest minds didn't get all this stuff right. But you have to be able to understand how interest rates are set, what inflation means, all these things, because the this is going to be the value add, right? Yeah, you can't your just be a cheerleader and be asking like, that. hey, let's sell, let's buy, like blah, blah. Yeah. No, no, you're going to have to actually bring expertise and, and knowledge to it. Uh, and that's what we're excited about the team, because that's the approach we're going to take to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, what else is new? So, uh, Not much. What do you have going on? Um, well, I'm closing on 12 units here in about, well, around this date. Um, remember all the times we used to talk about closings and then how they always got delayed? Um, mm-hmm. That'll probably happen. <laughs> so uh, this is supposed to close tomorrow um, based on when this episode comes out, but we'll see how that goes. And I'm kind of, you know, trying to make a plan and, and wondering, do I change my model a little bit? Because do I do the same scope of renovation? Do I not? Um, I'm not quite sure. Chandler, Chandler's like lining up the whole episode to reinforce his point later on in the episode. It's I like it. I'm just spitting facts here, Neil. If they happen to <laughs> stack on my side, then that's just the way it's just laying goes. the groundwork on the way up. Um, I'm also uh, continuing to negotiate and, and try to sort out that other deal, which was a collection of properties. And actually, people might find this a bit interesting. So as I mentioned, it's it's six parcels mm-hmm. uh, and a mixed bag of a uh, true multi-unit building, 16 units, and then a duplex, a duplex, a single family home, a vacant lot, a triplex. Like it is a mixed bag. So trying to finance that is complicated because um, some lenders would take some of it happily but don't want the rest. For simplicity with the seller, he'd love to just do it all under one agreement of purchase and sale, but maybe that's not an option. There's a phenomenal... Um, fixed rate assumable mortgage on the big piece at two and a half percent. So obviously I want to assume that, but that lender wants to do a deal specifically for those and their other package separately. So I'm having to go out there and get each property individually appraised and trying to massage that all together to make it work. And I think we'll get there, but it's a lot of moving parts at the same time as I'm closing another transaction at the same time that I'm renovating the 14 units. Blanket purchases are intense. Yeah, and and there's so many moving parts, yeah. and banks don't love moving parts. No, and they like they want to pick and choose which stuff they want, which they don't. Like when these portfolio yeah. sales take place, that's why they take so friggin' long. Because it's not even yeah. as simple as just yeah. like yeah, like it takes four weeks to close a building, so now we're gonna have the same things all happening at the same time, and then it's done. Yeah, there's so many little things that come up, and then they all impact each other. Like if one yeah. building has an issue, then that ends up crossing all the other buildings, like yeah. a debt service ratio, whatever it may be. This is why, like, I, I wanted to do a share sale on it, um, which is something that... So you can do either share sales or asset sales. We'll go into that in Patreon at some yeah, point, option, I'm sure. Um, but a share sale would just mean I bought the corporation, and then it's a little bit simpler, and the corporation owns all the properties. But he wanted to do an asset sale, so we're buying all the individual properties. Anyway, so working through that while doing all the other stuff and finally starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel on the on the renos. So Wouldn't a share sale be more benefit to him? Oftentimes it is, and I don't know why he wouldn't want to do it. We'll talk about that on the Patreon because there's some amazing things with share sales. The thing is with share sales, take the assets and liabilities, and but... I was going to say, yeah, you just assume more liabilities, except I guess I don't know what his whole structure yeah. is and what he's got in there. But... Yeah. Um, uh, right, news? Let's go into some news, and I wanted to start with a little bit of a... Our last episode, I said, and man, the inflation numbers for May are going to come out any minute now. Yes. And literally, I wasn't even home back to my house, and they came out. That minute had passed. Yeah, and it was inflation for May in Canada was 7.7%, if I recall correctly, Holy which is... Holy shit. It's an astronomical number. Um, that's insane. It's insane. It, it's big, and... That's for a month? That that's that's um, year over year. That like, year over year. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, it's not like they're seven percent up from that make, yeah, okay. April. Yeah, okay. um, but that's still huge. That's absurd. Um, and <coughs> if it's more fodder for the the Bank of Canada going to seventy five basis points here uh, in the next week when they meet again, because we thought anything more than twenty five points would be crazy, and they you know did fifty without a batting an eye. Um, and we thought they'd never do more than 50, but then there was talk of 75 basis points and the Fed down the States to 75 basis points. And then when you hear that number come out of 7.7 inflation, it's all pointing at, at 75 basis points for the next mm-hmm. increase. So, um, if you take a prime rate out there, that's 3.7, that's probably going to go up to about, 
Um, most likely the, the prime rates will be around 4.5 or 4.4, whatever, so somewhere in there. And that'll, you know, by, by relation, pull up people's variable based products. Here's the problem that I see with this. And again, everyone's probably understanding it now. But the reason this is different than previous times when they can just turn on the interest dial and turn down the inflation dial is that we have such shortages of everything. Like we're going to have screw ups on all, like, so we have housing shortage. It doesn't get included in the inflation number, but that means we still somehow need to house people. Mm-hmm. We have a food shortage, right? We're not facing it here yet, but there's other countries that are having literal issues like getting food. Like poorer countries are struggling to get food right now. They're not selling sriracha until October. It's a real thing. <laughs> The shit got real. We well, have no sriracha. More. But the, the bigger like question mark that makes it really sketchy is food is something that takes time to do, to grow. And yeah. it herds take time to establish, like years. We're talking years. Like right? farming is based on years. And so past years, they've reduced their yields. And there's like water shortages and all these other material shortages and fertilizer shortages that they're facing that are causing this to stack up. And so it's going to get worse. So this even though interest what- rates are up, mm-hmm. The food's not, it's not like it's now tr- prices are going to come down because yep. it, the prices are going to remain high. Well, this is where we talk about what they're doing is things to slow demand, right? Make people feel poor. They will not spend as much money. Yep. None of that affects supply. And supply is the biggest issue right now. There is not an interest rate out there. They make everybody skinny. What's that? That's the only way we can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm in then. <laughs> Jack the interest rates. Hit me with it. Um I mean, there's not an interest rate out there that is going to make oil cheaper. There's not an interest rate out there that is going to resolve the the conflict in Ukraine to then make wheat cheaper again. There's not an interest rate out there that's going to make China open up the full strength of its economy and the shipping. So none of these interest rate adjustments are going to have any tangible impact, certainly not in the short run, which is another point we'll get to in a second, on aggregate supply, which is the big issue. And this is why we're going to have stagflation because in the inflation is going to stay high, but there's going to be unemployment as we contract demand. All these things, um, and then the, the reserve currency. We'll get to this to further drive down the USD. Well, I want to talk about this seven point seven five. The seven. Everything. I want to talk about this inflation for a second more because they attributed it primarily to oil prices, oil and gas, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which makes sense. Yep, and it's something crazy like year over year what oil is up. It's probably. I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but it might be almost 100% from this time last year. Probably. Right? Um, Which raises the logical question. Why not remove some of the government, some of the taxes at the pump? So... I'm not... If you can't hear me right now, but I'm throwing my arms around up in the air. And this is being being considered... Biden's looking at this. Uh, I think Alberta's looking at this. A few countries over in Europe are looking at this, calling it like you know, gas vacations where they, they at least temporarily pull the taxes off this. Um, just to break it down for people and shout out to my buddy Blair because he works in this space and he gave me high level numbers. Um, here for, for round numbers, say that gas at, at the pump is two bucks, about 50, 52 cents of that mm-hmm. is straight tax, That's 50 cents, yeah. straight tax, yep. HST. And some of it's taxes on taxes. Yep. Right, because it's taxed, and then you throw HST on it, and then you throw whatever carbon, environmental tax, whatever on yeah. there. So two bucks, yeah. fifty odd cents of it is straight tax. Yeah, and yes, that that impacts us every day at the pump, but it also impacts shipping and production mm-hmm. and all these things. If you take that out, now that is a real shift in supply that potentially increases supply, which has deflationary pressure. The challenge is, we well, are shaking your head, so let's hear it. Okay, so. I'll let you fin. Okay, so I'll get into it. It's my, my reason I don't think that necessarily. I think it's a temp. That's a super temporary way of fixing the problem. Um, because for us, it's going to give us a little momentary lapse on the pump of like, oh, we're saving twenty five cents. I feel much better about it, which is really good. Realistically, those tax dollars do go towards road maintenance. And in Nova Scotia, they should probably be charging about five dollars a liter because currently our roads are literal minefields. So, like, yeah. if they pull that off, all it's going to result in is further degradation of our systems around like our um, infrastructure but more so what i'm i'm keen well, on newsflash man like we're gonna have to contract government spending as it is but we no, have, but let me, we let have rolled out a lot of taxes let and also finish. i didn't get to say my answer okay, what yeah, i think yeah. is better All right. so <laughs> no, no. the the go for it my my thought is and that's a good one for temporary help it's amazing but as like a long-term fix 
They need to look at the actual industry as a whole and try and reduce some of the tax and the measures that they put against it to make it easier to produce and actually have the product in our own country. Like that will have a benefit in so many ways because it'll it'll make it cheaper at the pumps. It'll employ more people. It'll bring actual more tax dollars into the system and everything will end up growing from that. Versus yeah. if you give a temporary break on taxes, yes, in the short term, it will help with things. But long term, it's actually kicking the, down the road because we'll have less money available for the infrastructure and we'll be in a worse problem than we are in now. Yeah. So if you actually, but if you fix it, if you fix it at the root, which is like producing the oil, because the other thing is, again, as, as we pump more fucking free money into this system, our dollar becomes worth less and less money. And so it's harder and harder to buy oil from overseas or from the States. This well, it also means that more of our oil is going to continue to be exported because the issue, people have this idea of, well, why, why does it cost so much for oil and gas here when, when we have it here? It's like, it's a global market, man. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, if if we don't pay a certain price for it, they're just going to send it down to the eastern mm-hmm. seaboard seaboard of the states. Like it's, and we keep devaluing our dollar, so it's cheaper to buy from here than for us to go buy yeah. anywhere else. So it's hard, and I find myself torn in this because I'm I'm pro the oil and gas industry because I I, I think we we need it. Sorry, that's the reality. We need it to be affordable, um, but trying to restrict it and make it Canada first and supply ourselves first. Obviously, the oil and gas industry doesn't like that, but also it's in some ways not possible, uh, but we just need to let it move around easily and get refined more easily here. Yeah, we need to be making it. I don't know how to do that. I'm not going to I think we're that. arrogant as a population to think that Canada can just be like, oh, yeah, we're fully renewable. Uh, nobody pays for health care. Nobody pays for university. Nobody pays for anything. And, and if you don't, if you can't work, you don't work. Like, like what do you, what, how do you think that we're so far advanced that yeah. we can just do all of this stuff and somehow there'd be no repercussion for it. And if you want to be living in a so far advanced place like that, it's going to be super expensive. The only countries that have it are ultra, ultra expensive. Like people like some of these places in Europe that have some, a few more of these social programs and don't do these things. Take a look at what the cost of like real estate is or the cost of a car or the cost of anything. It's insane. Like it's like, I mean, insane. Like you go over there and a house is like 2 million euros, which would be like three and a half million dollars Canadian. Like, Shout out Jeff Townsend when he was like, um, when we put up that clip about the most affordable uh, city in Canada. Yeah. And, you know, you said somewhere in Alberta. And I was like, oh, what, a, you know, that's, or Vancouver. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, Alberta is more affordable to live there because of all these. This is it. These tax things. And, and you know, yes, the, the cost of the housing is is higher, but maybe the jobs are better paying and there's less tax. So it's actually more affordable. Exactly. D- agree or disagree. Shout out Jeff. I don't but, know. But. Um, give a, give a temporary tax break, all good in the hood. But at the end of the day, like we need to, as a country, make more money to be able to do any of these things. And I just don't understand how people think that it's not, it's going to get solved through like a break in the short term. Devil's devil's advocate. Go after you for it. But yeah, devil's advocate. Because the question is like, well, why wouldn't the government do this? One, they love that sweet, sweet money as much as anyone else. Right. So they've been riding that cash cow as oil's gone up. They've just somehow been like, oh, well, you know, we'll just keep that money. Right. So That, that's part of it. There's no question about it. They love those tax dollars. That's why maybe you don't get rid of it all, but maybe you just keep the same taxes that you used to get when it was a dollar. Yeah. Why do you have to get double the amount of taxes now? Because mm-hmm. you were doing fine when it was a buck. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Um, the the perception out there, rightly or wrongly, is that corporate greed will kick in. They'll be like, oh, so you know, gas prices at the pump are down 50 cents. Well, me as a corporation, maybe I can charge you know, 25 cents more and the consumer's still happy because they're saving and I'm making all this more money. Mm -hmm. I think that's bullshit. Uh, Not that they wouldn't try to do that, but we live in a world where we're able to roll out all of these programs and data track. You're telling me you can't produce some sort of system that could reliably peg the price of oil and, and, and gas and say whether or not that price gouging is actually happening or not. I don't know, man, figure it out. We figured Mm -hmm. out how to roll out, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to people and, and vet their employment status and all this crap. And then we figured out how to go after them with CRA I mean, afterwards. Horses were getting know. served, but <laughs> it was not perfect science. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, figured out, man, like figured out. Yeah. Um, the other thought is that once you remove a tax, it's really hard to put it back on. That's and bullshit. that's the biggest they, thing. Yeah. They always bring them back. Well, you everyone know, everyone gets pissed off and opposes it, but have they ever not gone through? Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good point. But this is this is one of the arguments as to why the government hasn't started pulling some of these taxes back on oil and gas because mm. it has a huge impact on everyone's livelihood and and all these things. Um, 
Yeah, Shit's what else is messed. going on in the news? Yeah, things are messed, man. It's messed out there. So there's a tro- Toronto landlord in the news right now. Ooh. He Do put up a little them? rental <laughs> ad. <laughs> yeah, he put up a rental ad. Yeah. For a bedroom. But Singular? actually just the bed within the bedroom. And it's four hundred and twenty dollars a month. But good news, like you only share lava, you, you can't only, walk on the You rest only of the share floor. the bedroom with two other people who also rent beds. Yo. So to rent a bed in the bedroom in Toronto, four hundred and twenty bucks a month. And you know what? I bet you he got it rented. So the whole room is producing twelve hundred dollars a month. That whole room, room is and that's and I I'd be willing to bet that's what room rent is there. How much extra does he charge for the kitchen? Oh yeah. man. The person Not shows included. up you have goes to like, Yeah, where's the bathroom? Like that bathroom's gonna cost you, buddy. <laughs> uh, here you go. YMCA down the street. Oh uh, my gosh. Yeah, that's where it's gotten down there. In New York, there was a place three hundred and it was one bedroom. I think it was like three hundred and twenty seven square feet. Uh, and it was in the East Village pretty sweet area. Um, and it was rent controlled for about 2,300 bucks. And they got like, uh, there was an hour long lineup to get in to see it That's insane. because it was low. What it's market rent would actually be around 3000 and the median rent on 2, Manhattan. 2,300. Yeah, and yeah. They still line up. That's USD too. So that's three grand. Well, no, that's because it was rent controlled. It would normally be three thousand. Um, oh god. But uh, the median rent on Manhattan just surpassed four thousand bucks a month. That's median. no way. Yeah. Holy. Fuck. Yeah. So I mean, people are gonna be like, "Oh, nice rent control. Lucky them." It's like, yeah, but you know, he got hundreds of applicants, so he probably went with like the doctor. Uh, also, as I say, it's still you know? it's still twenty three hundred a month, and it's still twenty three hundred bucks, and the median is four thousand, so it's not exactly working. But this landlord's got the pick of whatever tenant they want, and it's not going to go to someone who like necessarily needs it the most, right? All right, thanks for listening up to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. It helps us so much. Uh, we're kind of bouncing all over the place here today, but we are going to get to whether or not the Burr model and the OPM model are dead. I'm calling it. I'm saying they're over. Neil's a little more optimistic, Chandler's contrary lying. to normal. Well, let's keep listening. Check it out. Um, That's what always happens. I was talking to landlords here and like, yeah, we had rent control here before. And all it meant was I just took the top applicant and the people that were supposed to be getting saved by the rent control could just never get an apartment. Yeah. And you're already seeing it happen here. It's happening in Toronto. Um, oh, you know, yeah. go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to give you another pop quiz because I was thinking about this where we were talking about affordability. And, People love uh, the pop quizzes. Pop quiz for Neil. So this one's going to be um, a little bit different because uh, this think tank came out with a livability index. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they took like, I think it was 137 cities across the world. Mm-hmm. So major cities only we're talking here. Mm-hmm. Across the world. Yeah, yeah, and they rated them on a bunch of criteria. Um, I need a heads up I don't so know I can how many study criteria. for these. 30 factors. The factors mainly were healthcare, mm-hmm. infrastructure, mm-hmm. transit, culture, education, entertainment, sports. So we're talking like lived experience in these cities. Okay. Um, and there were, I think, something like three Canadian cities that made the list. So think... You know, basically, it sounded like just awesome places, fun places to live. Um, not necessarily affordability, but just overall livability. So what the almost. three Canadian cities were yeah, on we're this three, list? Yeah, three Canadian cities. Can we go over the, the couple items again really quick here? So we had transit, infrastructure. Yeah, so it was a livability index Liv- based on things like, well, 30 factors, but based on things like um, transit, mm. infrastructure, healthcare, education, sports, entertainment, culture. All of that that goes into what makes a city a city, and three Canadian country or three Canadian cities made the top, I think, one hundred in the world. Vancouver, Toronto, Halifax. Oh, two out of three. Vancouver, Toronto, and Calgary. I was gonna say Calgary. I was between Calgary and Halifax. Son of a bitch. So th- those of you out in Vancouver, Toronto, and Calgary, show some pride. No way. Apparently, you've got one of the most livable cities. Damn. And I was I was a bit surprised because, like, well, that's obviously not Halifax looking into affordable. That, that There's not an affordability component to that. But, yeah, they've all got major sports teams. They've all got really good arts and music scenes. True. We don't have um, shit. I just got a little biased because I live here. Yeah. We're scaling up, though, man. Uh, we do. We were growing. We're growing. We're growing. We are just very small still. So, on a, on a world scale, we don't have what it takes to make any of the lists. Yeah. We don't get the big concerts or anything. But no, I'm looking out at a harbor right now and there isn't a single boat parked at any of the wharves. So we, we have a ways to go, but we're growing. Um, yeah. I was going to say, so it's, we're all talking doom and gloom. Like no one wants yeah, to buy anything, pump the market. Well, good news is the most expensive house in the history of Florida has sold $173 million 
to Larry Ellison, the CEO and founder of Oracle. Okay. Um, hmm. And good for him is it has 30 bedrooms. So if you get 30 times three, so you get 90 beds at $420 I a month. Oh, my God. It might not be the worst investment ever. Like, yeah. But he's going to be bringing in bank. Like he's going to bring in like 35 grand a month against 173 million. It might be like a 0.01% cap. Like he's. <laughs> oh, my God. He's going to be stacking it. He, uh, I don't think he noticed that he bought it because he has about $83 billion. Hmm. So this would be like one of us buying like a chicken fried sandwich for lunch. But I'd love to just walk around his house with my shoes on. <laughs> Step on his couch. But I, I guess the ultra rich aren't too concerned about what's going on. And I guess that's because they also don't borrow money to buy these houses. Um, so when you pay cash, interest rate could be 45% and it doesn't hmm. seem to really matter. Well, also Florida, there's this big movement you know, people to Florida. West to East. Yeah. Florida, man. Cheaper taxes, all these things. Less um, uh, bureau- bureaucracy. So, yeah. What else do you have that's kind of... Oh, well, man, I, I found some interesting anecdotes. Oh, the vacant um, home info. I want to go over that. I have a bunch of stuff on that. Okay. Um, so one well, of the things about the, the interest rate and why this is going to take so long is because it takes about 12 to 18 months for the actual interest rate changes to trickle down to all walks of, of the economy. Yep. Um, Prices for stuff just don't change overnight, especially when you get into the supply side and the wage labor market, all these things. Um, so it's kind of scary to think that all of these increases that are happening now and the government's like, it's not happening quick enough. We're not slowing inflation yet. Yeah, it's because it's going to take a long time. So we're probably going to be in this rut for 12 to 18 months for those of you who've been been asking. But there have been some signs of um, consumer demand slowing down. So there was kind of a, a, a quick study by U.S. importers from China, and, and they said that the actual imports um, from China are down like 20 to 30 percent, and it's almost exclusively driven by um, the cost of like construction items and household items. So demand for things related to the real estate sector are driving a drop in, in net imports from China by 20 to 30 percent in the U.S. Um. Yeah, that I, I'm feeling it. Like I'm with you though. It's like it's a lagging response on the actual data, but when you're actually out there in the field, you're feeling it right away. Whether you're in real estate, like I said, I have a few friends that own yeah restaurants and cafes, and like I'm just noticing it just a little slower. Even though people are back at the office, we're a little slower in here. Selling these eight dollar lattes is not going as hot as it was before. This is what was frustrating about that seven point seven five percent in May. We have to realize that's a month ago, and a lot of that reporting is from sales that were transacted two months before that. So there were people who bought properties in February that closed in, you know, May, for example, or, you know, they moved in and they went out and they bought that new sofa and all these things for the house. And I mentioned real estate specifically because that is a huge part of our our demand, our consumer demand in, in, in the industry. So I think there's still a big lag on that inflation number. I'm optimistic it's it's going to come down from there but um with that big report like i said they're gonna they're gonna jack the rate however we're not gonna come close to zimbabwe guess how much zimbabwe just raised their bank rate um they are always what do you not keep up on you know zimbabwe i, I do but i gave I gave, I gave up when like a banana cost 45 billion then i was like all right their their currency is broken well so yeah they're they're super trying to get what is the currency they're called the it's a dollar, know. isn't it? I'm not sure what it's called, actually. But they just raised their bank rate by 200 points. So we're freaking out over 50 and 75. They just raised this, their banking rate by 200 points. I, I so don't know that... It's Zimbabwe called... Zimbabwe? Uh, no, they use... The, they use It's called a dollar. Um, yeah, look. So you could... A hundred trillion dollars in Zimbabwe, 476 bucks. Man, at some point, just move the decimal. I never understood this. It, Move the decimal over, Zimbabwe. How many U.S. dollars is 100 trillion <laughs> Zimbabwe dollars? 40 U.S. cents. <laughs> Move the decimal, bro. Just I, I just want to be known as a trillionaire. I might have to throw down a dollar on this. Yeah. Um, Big flex. Now, this is this is what I wanted to talk about. Yeah, well, you, you want to talk about some other currency stuff. No, uh, well, that currency stuff, and before I go, well, sure, we'll go into the currency thing first, but I want to talk about uh, also how everyone's talking about how it's so unaffordable to buy a house now, and young people are hooped, and on and on and on. Uh, so we're going to chat about that here in a second, but I'll talk about the currency thing, and this is just a me throwing this topic out there for the conspirators and the people who follow this. 
and I've been kind of loosely alluding to it for the last like couple months. Uh, world order, uh, China, Russia, uh, making the their own reserve kid. currency. So Kevin world Nash. order is basically Razor Ramon. <laughs> is the country like kind of effectively run the world, and they're right now it's USA, and we use the US dollar, and they're considered the most powerful country in the world. It used to be the UK, and the sterling was the the, the leading currency, and you go mm-hmm. back further and further and further. Um, now, China and Russia are a lot, I would say, stronger as a whole than the states are. Not a Russia of, right now in this moment, but I know what you mean. Yeah, but when they're combined with China, they have, and so Russia, China, India, and a few other major countries have begun the process of looking to change the current world's reserve currency from USD to the yuan which would be insane. Like that's a massive, massive change. Everything we do is based off USD. All of the goods in the world are traded off USD. It allows the US to sell all of their debt internationally. Mm -hmm. So when that changes, it's going to put further downward pressure on the dollar. If you look at like the value of the dollar too, everywhere it goes, it's gone down and down and down. This will continue to force that. So what that means if for somebody, if you own assets in the States, it can actually be a great thing. Because those values of those assets in USD will actually go up a fair bit because the dollar is worth a lot less. But as right. a whole, the economy can take a massive beating. And I'll it, have to it'll see. I'll continue have to, to that. force that that difference between the rich and the poor. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, I'd, I'd be curious. I'll have to look into that because I know the US dollar has been actually doing really well of late. Um, mainly because other countries are struggling and they've been moving stuff to the, to the US. Um, yeah, I mean, this is that like cyclical nature of empires. Right? Exactly. Empires fall, man, and the U.S. has been the empire for a while. Um, it, it looks hmm. very much like timeline-wise what's going on with global turmoil. Um, and now with this, the idea of the reserve currency, like so many things are lining up that I'm like, it's got to change. Again, that's a that's a separate little topic. I want to throw that out there. Another thing I wanted to put out, the, go ahead. I was just going to say that if you look at projections for like what countries are going to go through the biggest booms over the next 10 years, it's India. Yeah. Right. And increased westernization, um, slowing population, increased industrialism or like commercialization, I guess, um, rather than industrial revolution. I had a few clients from India that said to me that they stopped buying real estate here and they kept buying it there because here we think 20 percent is amazing. He said there I can turn around and sell a property for three times as much as I paid at the end of the year. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, Yeah. So I I think based on all projectors, India is going to skyrocket and become a, a real world economic power uh, over the next couple decades. And I think Indonesia is up there as well. Yeah. Um, so if you look at that shift from everyone talks about the Western world, the Western world, Europe and over here, um, the, the pendulum swings back and forth. And if it swings pronouncedly in that direction, why would we, you not switch the, the kind of currency of reference? It only makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's just, I'm again, being in North America where we rely so heavily on the USD and everything's based on that for us, the impact that it'll have. We're also like stubborn. No one is here is going to, you know, the rest of the world like learned English because we were all too lazy to learn any other languages. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. we're stubborn. Anyways, let's get into our topic, man. Unless you got any other. I have juicy. one last okay. item and I just want to put this quiz? out there. I like pop quizzes it's and I never get to do any. Okay. I should start lining up some pop Frame quizzes. Frame it in the form of a question. I'm Jeopardy trying style. to think of a, of a good way. Mm. Just give her. Just go for yeah, it. Yeah, there's no good way to do okay. this. But the idea is, is everyone today says it's impossible for the youth to get in. And this there, there is going to be, when I st- I'm going to preface this with, I understand there's a lot more factors than this. But when you look at interest rates in the 80s and the price of houses, mm-hmm. the actual effective payment, so for a $200,000 house, to take a one-year mortgage at that time was 19%. The mm-hmm. average mortgage rate was 17%. Your monthly payment on the average home, which was in Canada, was 200 grand. So the average really? home in the 80s, the average home in Canada was 200 grand. Yeah, yeah. I can believe that. Okay. And the, at the at an interest rate of 17% on average, your payment was three grand a month. I had a, a client of mine just and that, two days ago tell me that he was paying like you know two thousand dollars a month on his mortgage for a very small home back in the 70s or 80s and he couldn't believe it and he couldn't he was underwater every month and so yeah. this is the thing and now we're here and for three grand a month i mean again rates have spiked up quite a bit but just maybe six months ago that same three grand a month would buy you a six hundred thousand dollar house mm-hmm. so 
And realistically, now you're facing the appreciation on a property that's worth 600 grand. When, when, when the market goes up 20% and you own a $200,000 house, you walk out with 40 grand. I saw a lot of my friends and a lot of my colleagues and clients who bought $500,000 houses a year ago and sold them for 650K and they made $150,000 yeah. in that same time frame. Yeah. So they're like on a monthly basis. The one thing I will totally agree with is down payments are a lot harder to put together. Um, yeah. And the cost and your of exposure, everything. Your other, your other consumer debt's a lot higher. And well, and that's what I say. Everything else in your day to day is a fair bit higher. Mm-hmm. And also, incomes haven't increased proportionately uh, since then. But a lot, like, I, I, so I understand all those factors. But when you simply look at housing and you look at an actual monthly impact on your financial balance sheet, it's not as dramatically different as it used to be. Mm-hmm. And this is also where you look at literally the price of homes and rates, how well they are tied together. Mm-hmm. And so, what will happen is people will always, if they have $3,000, they will spend the $3,000, whether it's 1000 on principal and 2000 on on interest, mm-hmm. or you flip it and it's 2000 on principal and 1000 on interest. So like, it'll always go like that. And then the interest rate will just impact how much that's principal, which will impact the mm-hmm. dollar values of homes. But it's like a set standard amount that people are always willing to. To spend. Yeah, my buddy who mentioned this, and he he talked about the struggles he had, and he actually had to borrow money from his father, uh, and his father was a veteran, so he qualified for um, payment protection. No, there there was this veteran um, financing where you could get interest at like three percent when you came back wow. from war to to purchase a property. Um, this was exclusive to veterans, and um, so. He did quite well and then owned his house. And then all of a sudden he was able to loan out money to people because they were underwater paying 17%. And so he never made more money in his life than during those periods because he effectively became a private lender. This guy became a can, bank can utilizing you imagine, the veterans program. Can you imagine being a private lender back then where people would, you know, beg you to lend them money at 12% interest? Like they would beg you. Yeah. So, and they, maybe that was the first start of like the separation of how you know, uh, bad debt or, or over leveraged debt started to create these wealth gaps. And when we look at over a long enough timeline, that's where we are today. You know, this, this debt crisis, if we want to call it that, that this personal or consumer debt problem that we're going to have, this inflationary debt um, is going to create a, a bigger gap in income. But yeah. A hundred percent. We won't go too much further into that because we do need to hit uh, our actual topic. We want to go yeah. into And I think we're going to talk about this in another episode as well, because this is going to be a fairly interesting one and we're going to, go back and forth on it. I can already see. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the Burr model, which is buy, renovate or rehab, uh, rent, refinance, repeat. Mm -hmm. I get all those in there. And when we started this podcast, I couldn't believe how much that model was out there being sold and being talked about because it was just the common sense thing that everyone had done for a long time where you buy a, a distressed property, you renovate or rehab it, you know, improve it. Then you rent it out to a tenant. Then you refinance it at the improved value based on uh, the cash flow, And that pulls all your equity out. So then you can go and buy another property. That is the Burr acronym. Mm-hmm. And it's what people have been doing for, for years. It's what you and I do. Yeah. Um, OTP. That OPM is other people's money. Oh, OPM, sorry. Um, you're down with OPM. Other people's money is effectively, uh, it could be a, a joint venture structure or it could just be a, a private loan where if you don't have the down payment, someone fronts you that, you've got your model where you effectively burr the property yep. but with someone else's money and then you buy the moat at the end. So the OPM is sort of like the next level of burr. It's burring with no, any of your own cash. I've done that as well. And both of these things have been aggressively sold and marketed to people and you know, you'll see these clips like that's how I went from one property to 16 and this amount of years. And I've never been a huge fan of the OPM because oftentimes you don't end up with full ownership of the property. Yeah. Um, but, you know, joint ventures are, are for some people. They haven't been for me. Whatever. Uh, neither here nor there. The problem is the entire basis of that model is the refinance at the end. Yep. And when the market was going aggressively on its own without you could essentially have bought the same house, not changed it yep. and have been up 80 to a hundred thousand dollars, say on a, on a $300,000 home, 25%, like 25%, 35, 35% yep. without doing anything. Yep. In 12 months. Um, it made anyone look like a genius. Yep. Um, and the 
beauty of it too is then when you went to refinance, you're refinancing at these dirt cheap rates. We're now in a situation where if the market stagnates, you could put $50,000 into a property and when it's done, it's still worth $50,000. And if you go back to try to refinance, there's going to be no money to even pay yourself out and then the, do the last R, which is repeat, or buy out your OPM partner. So what you're trying to say is the models are dead. Dead on arrival, man. Yeah. Right now, this is the moment. Those models are dead. If you're listening to this, you probably have, are familiar with those. I don't see in the next two years how those models are going to be viable. How are you going to pay someone out at the end of a refinance? For Maybe you're on a, a, a true commercial and you're only going to get 70% loan to value on your pullout. So I don't think they're dead. Two things. like The number, the number one thing is you just got to get re- a really good buy. Right? Like I think the big one okay. is, is people are charging crazy numbers for investment properties like multi-units went ballistic and so yeah if you're going on market and just buying something for the sake of it and there's only a small little lift and it was just going to cover its cost yeah that one's dead that one's dead like you're gonna it's gonna take a while to get your money out um but any of these ones where there's still a, a large lift you'll get your money out like i'm looking at my projects and i've done opm and i'm doing the burr and all that crap and fortunately we bought with a large enough lift that i'm like i will get all the money back out everything will get paid off I am going to leave some money in there and mm-hmm. I'll have to look at it in 18 months. What I'll do is I'm going to take a 24 month term in two years time. I'll look at doing another proper refi and taking it up to 75 or 85% to get the rest of the capital out. But in the short term, the model is not dead. I'm able to still go. I'm just not going as aggressively and as fast and I'm not necessarily pulling out as much cash. And I think in more expensive markets, a lot of people are used to that, right? Like in it's what we're even seeing here now. Like we talked about this before all this started happening and prices weren't increasing, we said, if I'm going to start burrowing, I'm not going to do it in Halifax. I'm going to go to Truro where it's a cheaper market. And at the end of the day, they're still income based. Those loans are being improved income based. So now you have to do your burr model. You need to be a little more diligent with your pen and you with your Excel and you just say, okay, I know what the debt service ratio that my bank needs is. I went to Truro. I bought a 10 unit. I ran, but before I bought it, I ran all the numbers and my end value is this based on that. The debt servicing will cover this much money on the way out. And, it, and then it's good. And it's going to be a little less. So now instead... But what are you building in there for a hypothetical interest rate? This is the put, problem, right? We don't put know. It, put it a couple points up at the end of the day. If the, if the rates go through the roof, like through the roof, which I've screamed that I think they might, uh, then you could definitely be in, in a tighter spot. But I think in general, if you're going to think that the rates are going to go up like 4 to 5% on top of what they're at now, uh, then you probably shouldn't be buying. But I don't think that the model in general is completely and totally dead. The other thing is... When you do other people's money, you make it known to your investors that they understand that, okay, this is not as a short-term play as it used to be. But in general, real estate pretty much anywhere in Canada is not the short-term play it used to be because of all the rules and guards on tenants, evictions, renovations, gonna, all yeah. those things. Anyways, you couldn't do any of these in six months anymore. But there's going to be a big, big contraction in, in the even the supply of other people's money. We talked about this in another episode. As soon as things get a little tight... All these investors who are floating around and being like, oh, yeah, I'll throw a little dabble a little bit here, mm-hmm. startup over here, crypto over here, you know, they're not going to do it. And also, also, <laughs> also <laughs> the the rate of return that they're going to want. Like, so you're going to go to pitch them and say, oh, listen, um, I know your money's tight right now, uh, but I still want it. And uh, the rate of return is going to be less than it was before. They're going to be like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. But that's why you got to get investors. That's why you shouldn't be asking somebody for five hundred grand if they only have two million bucks. You got to be asking somebody who's got fifty million dollars for five hundred grand, and those guys are still making moves. Proof of concept is Larry Ellison just bought a thirty bedroom rental property for one hundred and seventy three million dollars. Yeah, we should have asked him. For See? Some money. See, that's what he and he's you know he wouldn't even notice. Right. I'm just saying, like this isn't this was this. Yeah, I'm gonna say this was a major industry for the last three years. It, yeah, yeah. This was a major industry, past tense. It's going to shrink immensely. It is going to shrink. And if it's shrinking to something like one-third, like a, a big burr, big OPM person would be doing at least three deals a year, yep. upwards of six, yep. right, depending on, on how aggressive they are. A decent person would do two and like a casual would do one. Yeah. I can't imagine that those don't get axed by 67%. So if you're doing three, you're maybe doing one. If you're doing one, you may sit on the sidelines for the next couple of years because you're also talking like, oh, you're still going to do your projects. Yeah, you've got your own liquidity. And if you can't get your money out on one, you might be able to get your money out of another project. The whole yeah. model, the whole model of the burr, especially when you, you have to with the OPM, extra to keep moving. And also 
when you pull that money out, that's what you're living off of because you quit mm-hmm. your job because you're burning properties and it's all so successful and blah, 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 blah. Yep. Well, now, man, you might want that job back. And newsflash, yeah. that job is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Chandler's coming in with some hot dogs. I'm just saying, man, yeah. this if this is where yeah. your cheese was the last three years, yeah. your cheese has moved. And people are going to have to get way sharper with their pen, pencils. The the model yeah. is also based on continued growth. And if there's no growth to be had, it stagnates very, very, very quickly. I, I think we got spoiled and it was too easy for too long where everyone was just buying anything and you could make money on it. This is what it used to be. You got to go like door knocking and you got to go to the properties that look dilapidated and you got to find the stuff that is a really a good deal. And you got to find the people that need to give up properties. That foreclosure auction is going to get busy again. There's going to be a lots of homes going through there because now, mm-hmm. six months ago, you'd throw your house in the market, it would sell over ask, you'd get all your money, you'd pay off your bills and it was whatever. You could kind of drag it on. Now, when you're starting to go under on your house, you just can't sell it. So mm-hmm. it's going to foreclosure. There's also going to be a bunch of other people with projects out there started looking for you to be the partner and looking for you to be the OPM. There's going to be lots right? of opportunities out there, I think, and yeah. really good deals. I think that's the difference is the buys. You're already seeing it. Like the multi-units are sitting on market. And I like, know. I want a 200 a door. Now I'm getting text like, I'll do 175. Yeah, oh, I'll do 145. People out there who are trying to like reassign stuff, like yeah. the reassignment market's going to dry up too. Reassignments are going to be. I'm um, like, oh, they were so hot for a while, but now, yeah, you can't just, you know, if, if unless you got something in the double digits, ideally as low as possible per door. Mm-hmm. Like if you got something around 50 to 60 a door, yeah, you're still fine, obviously. Yeah. But if you were thinking you're going to get stuff at like 90 a door and reassign it for 110, it's, I don't know, it's man, tight. I, it's tight. It's tight because. Yeah, people also can't find some on the purchase, like you're like you're seeing now. Like if it doesn't service the debt, so the models change. I don't think it's dead, but I think you got to be way more diligent in what you do. I had this conversation with a seller this morning. Like, look, man, we list your place. You didn't do anything to it to make it sell, and so it's sitting. But if we did what you would have done three years ago, which is go in there, yep, scrap yep. all the garbage your tenant left behind, paint the entire place, change all the light fixtures, and give it a pressure wash on the outside. It would have sold, but you yeah. have to do that now. Sweat equity is yeah. back. It's not just, yeah. uh, just everything you touch is just hot, hot money. Like, and, you, and you're good to go. You actually need to be diligent. You actually need to put in some effort. You need to really run your numbers. You actually need to go over all of that. You can't just be flailing about and making money out of it. So, and, and there'll be a lot sweat- of people that are that are going to lose all their shit. Not all their shit, but there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have to make moves or sell things out or not be interested in the business anymore. Or say no to a deal because it's not a good enough deal. Exactly. Not every good deal, every, not every deal that comes across is a good you're, deal. You're going to be able to take. Right. And it's, it's too bad because we all, if you're in this industry, like you want every deal yep. and you're going to have to say no to some things right now, but I love it. Sweat equity is back. I think that's a great note yep. to end this episode on. Thanks so much for listening. Get sweaty. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you guys. See you guys. Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe, but also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. When, 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 when I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.